I have been binge watching Deltarune theory videos for like, months. It has been consuming my life and will not stop. This video serves no purpose, I, I just felt like spewing out random thoughts and ideas. Got all that? No? Too bad, keep up. I'm very tired so let's just get into it. Let me start off with the most elusive character in all of Undertale, W.D. Gaster. There's probably a few of you in the audience who don't know who Gaster is, and if that's the case, I recommend checking out this video by Misty Sparkles. Most dedicated Undertale fans already know who this is, even though, ironically, we don't actually know that much about him. Undertale establishes the character as the royal scientist before Alphys, who created the core and then quote fell into his own creation. Thus, they were scattered across time and space. He speaks in wingdings, wrote a weird lab entry, has a basic theme, and has associations with Sans and Papyrus. Okay, that's who Gaster is in Undertale. Now let's move on to Deltarune. When Deltarune was first unveiled, it was preceded by a series of messages on Twitter, presumably left by Gaster himself. The messages say they have something to show us, and they release Chapter 1 under the guise of a survey program. So this establishes two things. One, Gaster has canonically used Twitter. Terrifying, I know. Second, the way he describes the survey program seems to imply Gaster himself created it, and by extension, Deltarune. Like, the actual game. Obviously he didn't, we have the credits to prove it, but that is what the text kinda insinuates, and it makes me wonder how much control Gaster actually has over this game. Maybe the entire world of Deltarune is just one giant lab experiment. Technically, we haven't seen Gaster in the game yet, but we have talked to him. The text at the beginning of the game is also Gaster, it has the same formatting and spacing. The only difference is the font. Gaster spoke in Wingdings and Undertale, but here he isn't. This might not mean anything, Misty Sparkle's video addresses this fact, but it does make me think. Deltarune is an alternate timeline or reality from Undertale's, featuring similar characters in different contexts and roles. And considering Gaster was scattered across time and space, is it possible that the Gaster we interact with in Deltarune is a different Gaster from the one in Undertale? The song that plays in the character creator is called Another Hymn, after all. If so, what does that mean? What experiment was Undertale's Gaster conducting? What is Deltarune's Gaster doing? Is either character aware of both games? Gaster is just an odd person. We know next to nothing about him or his motivations. He likes to mess with darkness, I suppose. Gaster is a dick. But everything about this character is just shrouded in darkness. By the way, what the hell's with the eggs? Undertale and Deltarune both feature a narrator, an omniscient character who describes the actions of you and the other characters. They have a bit of a personality and can be a tad snarky when they want to. The narrator is also the one who directly talks about game mechanics, like pressing buttons on your controller for example. Why does this matter? Because of this. At the start of the game, Gaster leads you through a character creator. You name it, make the appearance, everything. But at the end of this, the game cuts to black, the text changes, and now says your character will be discarded. There's evidence that suggests the one who discards your creation here is a different entity. There's someone else speaking in this scene. As for who, that's left unclear. But because there are no other prime suspects, I'm going to say it was the narrator. So that begs the question, who is the narrator? Well, regarding Undertale, there's a popular fan theory that the narrator is Kara, the fallen human you only officially meet in the Bad Boy run. There's some evidence that supports this, but it'd be too long to cover here. Here's another good video I recommend all about this topic. Personally, I don't believe in this theory, but it's plausible. But let's assume that this is the case. If the narrator in Undertale is indeed Kara, then who is the narrator in Deltarune? Is it Kara again? I don't think so, considering they don't exist in Deltarune. In fact, I'm pretty sure Chris is supposed to be them. Asriel's sibling loves chocolate, has an association with knives, same clothes, a lot of things match up. Is the narrator Chris then? That's certainly possible, though if it was, a few lines read a bit awkwardly. I guess Chris refers to themselves in the third person? I'm not sure. Maybe the text is actually the third entity people were on about. They are with you throughout the whole game, it would sort of make sense. On the topic of that, uh, yeah, there are some theories that Chris is actually being puppeted by two different entities. One is you, and the other is unknown. This is primarily due to how they act at the end of Chapter 2. Chris is the type of person who feels bad stealing five bucks from their bro, and slashing tires and creating dark fountains is a bit above that, just saying. I'm not a fan of the idea, I like the Chris and player dynamic going on right now, and adding in someone else muddies that theme. It could still work, but I don't think it's necessary. But if it had to be anyone, I don't know, how about the person who is literally just text? 
The knight is an elusive character that gets mentioned in both chapters. They are the ones who created the Dark Fountains, and are most likely the main antagonist. We also know that they created the Dark Worlds in the computer lab in the classroom, but probably not the closet one. That Dark World's funky. The identity of the knight has remained a mystery, but we do know that they are a lightener who probably lives in hometown. Currently, the primary suspect is Chris. They created the Dark Fountain at the end of Chapter 2, which is pretty damning evidence. Also, I'd like to add that while in the Dark World, Chris is a knight. They have the sword, the shield, they wear armor, Chris is literally a knight in shining armor. However, as Queen explained near the end of Chapter 2, pretty much any lightner can create a Dark Fountain. So that ending simply just confirms Chris can create Dark Fountains. Queen does say the fountain requires determination to create, which in Undertale most monsters do not possess. That doesn't seem to be the case in Deltarune, though, since Birdly attempts to create a Dark Fountain unprompted before Ralsei intervenes. This doesn't answer whether Birdly could or could not create a fountain, just that Birdly thinks he can. Now that I think about it, actually, Birdly refers to himself as a knight in glow-in-the-dark armor. If Birdly ends up being the knight, I swear to god. If determination is still only a thing mainly reserved for humans, though, then yeah, Chris is probably the knight. It would be odd, though, for Toby Fox to create this mystery surrounding the knight's identity, only to reveal it in Chapter 2 of 7. We still don't know their motivations, sure, but we can make some assumptions. Their full title is The Roaring Knight, so they probably want to cause the roaring for funsies. I'm not sure who else it would be. Other suspects I have include Des, Noelle's sister, uh, Papyrus somehow, Burger Pants? Fuck it, sure. If you follow the logic of the chess theory, which is a whole other thing, then you're expected to encounter and fight the knight in Chapter 5. I think that would make sense. Toby's planning on releasing the next three chapters at once, with the remaining two at a later time. If I had to guess how Deltarune's story will go, I think the main conflict with the knight will be resolved at Chapter 5. You fight them and potentially stop the roaring from happening, and that serves to end that story arc. Chapter 6 and 7 then will either be wrapping up loose ends, or revealing the true villain, which is Burger Pants, fuck you. While the knight is a very important character, I don't think they're the main antagonist, or at least the only antagonist. I think there is something else going on that we don't know yet. Starwalker Sham is a shopkeeper you meet in Chapter 1. They were originally a court magician, and they have ties to Jevil and Gaster. If this video was made when Chapter 1 released, th that's about all I could say. But with Chapter 2, there are a few new tidbits with this character. Shom seems to know more than they let on. They're the first person to acknowledge the Shadow Crystals earned from the Secret Bosses, and they seem to be aware of who the Secret Bosses are. Shom says that you'll need something called the Shadow Mantle to stand a chance against whoever will face in Chapter 3, so they already know who it'll be. Shom's general attitude is that of apathy, and even says that what we do will partly matter in the end. This lines up with what Deltarune and Toby Fox claim, which is that there will only be one ending. There's a question mark at the end of that, though. I see through your lies, you puppet. Shom reminds me a bit of Sans, mainly because of the attitude. Will we get to fight them in a future chapter? Eh, that's a possibility. Shom stood up to Jevil in the past, so they're probably a little tough. If that were to happen, though, then Shom would have even more parallels to Sans. Speaking of Sans, while I think he may get a larger role in later chapters, at the moment the game seems to be setting up Papyrus as the more mysterious character. We barely know anything about this version of Papyrus. Meanwhile, Sans is the same as ever. Now this wacky son of a bitch is great. Being a representation of the rules card, Rules is obsessed with making rules, and being ruled over. Are you sick of the word rules yet? After his appearance in Chapter 2, I had a few thoughts on my mind, all of which boiled down to this question. Is Rules actually important? Is he gonna be the fucking final boss or something at the end? I mean, just look at him. He's like Gaster's self-insert with a funny wig. That has to account for something, right? When there was only one chapter, Rules to me was just a quirky side character who also acts as a shop. But then he reappears in Chapter 2 and gets a whole boss fight, so now I'm not sure what he is. The fact that he tags along in Chapter 2 is just bizarre. Lancer makes sense, he's Susie's friend and played a large role in Chapter 1. But Rules, he has no reason to come along. And as soon as you arrive in Cyberworld, he books it and leaves. What a bastard. Is Rules secretly manipulating things in his favor, masquerading as a fool? Is he actually the Roaring Knight, playing 40 chess all along? Or is he just a red herring and holds no purpose? With Toby, it's hard to tell. I don't have a lot to say about Gerson, considering he's you know, dead, but I do want to say this about him. 
Gerson is the only person in all of Undertale to mention the Deltarune by name. The symbol itself shows up everywhere, but he's the only one to actually acknowledge it. The Deltarune holds a different meaning in that game, where it prophesies either killing or freeing all of monster kind. Deltarune's prophecy is completely unrelated to this. Still though, it's interesting that the one person who probably would know about the Deltarune legend in this game is coincidentally also dead, though his son Alvin is alive and likely will have some role in a future chapter. Maybe he could show up in the Dark World if one appears in the church? We have to go there at some point, I imagine. Alright, it's time to talk about the strangest Darkner in the game, the Prince of Darkness himself, Ralsei. There are many questions surrounding this guy, and the fandom generally views him with high suspicion. I don't think he's necessarily evil or anything, but I do think he has ulterior motives. People have already dissected Ralsei to hell and back, so I only want to say a couple of things. 1. Ralsei is the person who introduces the idea of Darkners turning to stone while not in their own dark world. Ralsei, however, is completely unaffected by this. People have used this as more evidence that Ralsei is lying and evil and stuff. But honestly, I think this one makes sense. Ralsei comes from the Castle Town's Dark Fountain. That fountain is made of pure darkness, which enables any Darkner to live there. So it stands to reason that Ralsei, who comes from that fountain, is also able to comfortably travel to other Dark Worlds. Nothing nefarious there. As for how he got to the Cyber World in the first place? Uh, yeah, I got nothing for that one. 2. Ralsei's appearance is very close to Azrael, like, nearly identical. The most common theory is that Ralsei in the real world is Chris's red headband from when they were a kid. Toriel is a teacher at the school, so it's plausible that the headband got lost in the school closet. But personally, I don't believe this, and it's purely because he can travel to other dark worlds. That shouldn't be possible, unless Ralsei is actually something that Chris is holding onto. He's also the only resident in Castletown, which is very suspicious. The presence of the town indicates that people lived here once, but where are they? Where did they go? I don't think Ralsei is even a Darkner. Most of the time, he's just referred to as a Dark World being. That's very specific. Third, Ralsei seems to be aware of the player, and by extension, the fact that he's in a game. He acknowledges game mechanics like pressing buttons on your keyboard and saving files. One thing I noticed on my first playthrough was that Ralsei renames Castletown in Chapter 2 to your name. But how? Where did he get that name from? Is he sneaking into my files? That bastard. That being said, I do feel the need to mention this. There is at least one other character who directly calls attention to game mechanics, and that is Lancer. In one scene, on the sign in Chapter 1, he says not to press C to open your menu. Yeah, that's it. So in the Spam to Neo fight, when about to get hit, Chris's soul changes from red to yellow. In the fight, your soul now fires projectiles, just like how the yellow soul functioned in Undertale. You don't control this, it just happens automatically, like a defense mechanism or something. In Undertale, Alphys is the one who initiated this change, by pressing a button on your phone. Man, phone apps can do anything these days. As for how it happens here, I don't know, gaster magic? That seems to be the answer for everything. So this fight opens the door for speculation. Assuming there is a secret boss for every chapter, they probably also have a soul mode associated with them. And like the yellow soul, they might even have some added functionality. From Undertale, we still have the blue, green, and purple souls to see, not counting the red and blue soul from the Mad Mew Mew fight. I think we'll see a few new soul modes as well in later chapters. I'm not sure what they'll add or change with the other soul modes though. There was this Deltarune fan game that came out a while ago, a fan-made battle against Mike, really well made I'll admit. You played as the blue soul and the game gave you a new ground pound move. I really like that idea personally. I'm not sure how you could improve upon green, maybe add more arrow types, or more directions to point towards. For purple, maybe changing up the line's direction. I'm not the most creative, but there are a few ideas. Deltarune is also missing the blue and orange attacks from Undertale. I didn't notice until a few playthroughs, but yeah, they haven't made a single appearance. Maybe Toby's saving them for a later chapter? Or maybe he just didn't like the mechanic? Who's to say? I want to end this off by talking about you, the player. You are a character who plays a role in this story, and you are the one who controls Chris and their friends. You input your name at the beginning, and you are represented as the soul. That is the instrument you use to control the characters and make choices. I'm pretty sure it's still Chris's soul though, but it's implied at least. Undertale did toy with this idea, the separation between you and Frisk, with Kara essentially representing the player. 
you get to name them, and on a first playthrough, you'd probably put in your own name. However, Kara is an established character in the world itself, so the message is a bit muddied. In Deltarune, though, there isn't a character who is meant to represent the player. It's just you. The central theme in Deltarune is the lack of choice. While Undertale flaunted the idea that every choice you make matters and will affect the world around you, in Deltarune it's very much the opposite. You can act nice or mean, spare or slay, but as a whole the story will remain the same. It's interesting how this idea, the lack of choice and control, can apply to both Chris and the player. With Chris, it's obvious. They tear the soul from their body to regain control, it's implied they relate to Spamton on some level who is a literal puppet, and they do try to rebel against the player in very minor ways. But even as the puppeteer, the one in control, you're still limited in what you can do. You're required to spare and fight for certain encounters, some characters are always recruited, you have no control over Susie when she's on her own. Even the most extreme route, the weird route, still ends roughly the same way. Your choices really don't matter here. Last thing I want to say about the soul is what Toriel says at the end of Chapter 2. When Susie asks Toriel where Chris is, she responds that Chris does this sometimes. Adding to that, the area next to the birdcage in Chris's room is apparently stained, and the cage itself has seen numerous crashes. So that has to mean, even before the events of the game, Chris has taken out their soul and run off, right? Why would they need to do that? What were they doing? Is it not their soul? Is having a soul gross? I don't know. Explain yourself, you mute lunatic. And yeah, that's it. I have more to say, but I really don't feel like making this video any longer than it already is. I am very tired. I hope to see you all in 2055, when Deltarune Chapter 7 is finally done, and I can bask in its glory. Until then, I can enjoy playing Hollow Knight Silksong in the year 2037. Video games are hard to make.